Welcome to Insights. I'm Dick Goldberg, and our subject today, loneliness, a feeling we've all experienced at moments, but for some of us it can be prolonged and very painful. It can come and go in our lives. What really is it? Is it simply a lack of meaningful human connections? Or do other factors, like our emotional makeup, contribute to this shadow of loneliness? With us today, Dr. Jack Rayner. Uh, Jack uh, offers nationwide courses uh, on two mental health professionals about how to deal with clients who are suffering from this feeling of loneliness. He's a professor of psychology and department head at Valdesta State University in Georgia, and he's been in private practice for 25 years. Jack, thanks very much for joining us. It is a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for the invitation. We have to begin with a definition. I mean, we think we know what loneliness is, but as an expert, how would you define it? Well, let me give you a very good definition, and I can give you a bit of context as well. In my practice, I have been working to study rural mental health. I was uh, practicing on the front streets of Atlanta for many years, and then over the course of time, have moved into practices in rural North Carolina and in the coastal plains of South Georgia and have heard more clients complain of feeling lonely uh, in the context of their therapy, and it begins to be a repeating issue. And so that's where my thoughts began to take me. I had a doctoral student, wonderful young man named Jonathan Martin, and he and I undertook a study of loneliness, which resulted in a book that has just been published. And so that's where all of this is coming from. What is the now, name of the book? The name of the book is called Isolated and Alone, mm. Therapeutic Interventions for Loneliness, and it's published by Professional Resource Press, and so it is now available, and we are very proud of it. It's a small book, it's approachable, mm -hmm. and it's not going to break people's pocketbooks. Well, let me it's ask you the thing. obvious here. Is, are your clients experiencing it because the way they live, they're out in the country alone? Well, perhaps. Let me give you my definition, and then we can Good. talk more about some of the psychosocial aspects of it. When I am talking about loneliness as a psychotherapy issue, loneliness becomes a debilitating condition that is characterized by a very deep sense of personal isolation, a sense mm -hmm. of emptiness, worthlessness, an increasing lack of, a, of control, which corresponds to uh, a rather interesting perception of personal threat. Certainly it's connected to depression, um, mm. impaired sleep, all sorts of physiological things that go along with being loneliness. But we have defined loneliness more as a process construct rather than a diagnostic descriptor. And so we talk about it as a component of the therapy process. Well, Jack, let me ask you, what is different about loneliness from just being sad and depressed? Well, everybody, as you had said, have periods of transient loneliness. Those are brief. They're, you know, we occasionally have lonely moods. They're associated with daily life. Then there is uh, the situational type of loneliness that we experience, and that's generally related to some type of specific change, like mm -hmm. geographic relocation, bereavement, divorce, yeah. things of the sort, that are severely distressing, but they just over time remit as the individual mm -hmm. plugs back in. The type of loneliness that I am describing is more chronic, and it's characterized by a lack of social relations for somewhere in the ballpark of two years. There's not a good deal of research that has been done that says when is loneliness chronic. And most of the time we think about acute versus chronic problems being characterized by six months. But this is much longer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the sense of this aloneness and this loneliness is based on the absence of intimate attachment. And so the individual does not feel as though they have anybody that they're plugged into, and that then they progressively lose their ability to stay plugged into themselves. 
And so when folks get this type of profound loneliness over the course of time, there's the loss of connectedness, the loss of community, and typically that then translates more into the personal emotional experience of feeling bored, feeling rejected, mm -hmm. and then there are pretty strong correlates with depression. What you're describing is um, kind of situational still. You don't have those intimate relationships that people need. But I'm wondering, are there people who, regardless of what their relationships are, suffer from this feeling of emptiness and loneliness? There are people who experience this or who are at greater risk. But again, because this is more of a process construct, what we have to, and it is a diagnostic criteria, what mm -hmm. we have to do is look around the sense of loneliness. There is, as I have said, a high correlation with people who are feeling the type of loneliness that I describe and social isolation. Sure. And so there is the lack of this whole sense of social contact. But mm -hmm. then what that translates internally, which is where it becomes more of a therapy and a counseling type of issue, is that this disconnection begins to affect self-esteem, sure. it begins to affect the sense of how much control the individual has in their lives, mm -hmm. it affects the sense of ability to self-disclose people who have this type of loneliness are much more prone to being suspicious of others. Um, and so it's, it, it's a rather insidious process that sneaks okay. up on an individual to the point then that they begin to feel diminished in most of their activities of daily living. Okay, what I'm hearing, Jack, is you can start out pretty healthy, but if you go through a long period of isolation, you start losing all kinds of self-confidence and efficacy in life. I see people in therapy, Dick, who come with a variety of complaints, whatever their presenting problem is, who will then, as we begin to talk more about integration and about ways that they can bring about effective change in their lives, who begin to discover that they have indeed isolated themselves from the world, therefore are having more difficulties uh, plugging back in. And so that type of loneliness, when an individual goes, uh-oh, I may have another problem here, mm -hmm. is where we begin to talk, because this sense of isolation begins to emerge as a very salient theme that prevents an individual from then making progressive and positive change. Okay, so you need people to feel okay. <laughs> Barbara Streisand was exactly right. Uh -huh. you, know, you really do need people. Now, you don't need many people. We did a fair amount of research with all of this, and we found that what people need is a confidant. Hmm. Now, the research says that a confidant allows you to get reattached and begins to give you more of a sense of vulnerability that feels good, mm -hmm. that feels uh, more open rather than it does frail or fragile. Mm -hmm. Now, in my practice, I have generally talked with folks, while most of the research says you need one, I will tell folks, you're going to need two or three people to help you see this through. And you want two or three people that are going to help you, who, that you can talk with, that you can disclose, that you can tell on yourself, that will have some type of interaction with you. And what you will find then is that you can begin to feel more freely and that you can have more of a shift of attitude in someone's presence. And so I really do think that what 
we have found is really quite accurate is that if we do not have those confidants, those folks that mm-hmm. we call our intimates, that we put ourselves at greater risk for some type of isolation and uh, loss of self. Well, do the, does the need for connection vary person to person? Where some person might need a intimate light and another person might need four good buddies they can share everything with? This begins to get very philosophical and it goes back to a lot of object relations theory that a psychologist studied when we were in school because it talks about how we attach to people. And in our very early lives, how we learn either to be anxiously attached or securely attached to either. That is from parental involvement. It's where we begin to learn how to have friends. It comes from peerage when children are young. And if there is ambivalence in the early relationship, all of that begins to factor into the adult experience of loneliness and isolation. And so, yes, there are different appetites for attachment. And some people can be quite alone and feel solitary. And that sense of being solitary feels healing, it feels inspiring, it feels creative. And then there are some people who cannot tolerate that sense of being by themselves and may need more confidants, more friends, more social contact. Mm-hmm. So in layman's terms, Jack, you're saying some people need more connection than others. Some people need more connection to others, and that is so personal, it's more like a thumbprint, and it's hard to predict. But most people can look back at other times in their lives when they have felt healthier and when they have felt better with themselves and can determine how much contact they need. Let me talk therapist to therapist. Yes, sir. I've seen clients who are depressed and lonely. Mm-hmm. And I find often they're, they're a little empty. They don't have interest. They don't have passions. They spend their time watching TV when no one's around. Yes. And I, I look at them and think they're kind of a likely victim of loneliness. But yeah. Because when they're alone, there's nothing going on. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, there is a fairly good sense that when an individual feels lonely that, well, one, therapeutically, you've got to help them to make sure that their container is intact, that what Uh they have in terms of their soul can hold newness and can hold better. Uh... And then the task is to take that emptiness and translate it from isolation to solitude. And that's Mm -hmm. the term Mm -hmm. that we have found, is that if you feel isolated, it's an empty, cold feeling. And solitude is more of a place of reflection, of rest, of Mm self-renewal, more of communion with the self. Okay, your Um, challenge, Jack, is to tell us in two or three minutes, how do you make that transition? Uh... Thoreau said to Walden, I have three chairs in my house, one for solitude, two for friendship, and three for society. So how do you do it in uh, 25 words or less? (laughs) You begin to give some sense of meaning to your life. Hmm. You find activity. You find meaning. You provide some new definition. uh, And you move from a sense of disenfranchisement to a sense of feeling connected, whether it's connected with yourself, whether it's connected with your activities, whether it's connected with other people. What you do is you find a way to plug yourself in something that feels good. And if you can't find anything that feels good, and people who are lonely oftentimes will come back therapeutically and say, there's nothing there, then what you begin to do is engage in altruistic behavior. Like what? Uh, do unto others without any sense that anything good is going to come Mm -hmm. back to you. That's the paradox of altruism, is that you spend personal time and resources on others because you're better for it, not Mm -hmm. because you think it's going to lead to happiness. You know, it's interesting. I had a question for you about are kind people less lonely than self-absorbed, selfish people? 
if we go back to all of the research that has been done on this, then the answer is clearly yes. Is that for an individual who is hard and brittle to puncture that shell, you offer yourself in service. And what that service, where you just give of yourself because you're better for it, and that mm -hmm. sometimes includes sacrifice, it sometimes includes giving of yourself more than you think that you can do, mm -hmm. that's gone lower. That egocentric, ego, uh, centric yeah. sense of mm -hmm. loneliness and of being, oh my gosh, uh, navel-gazing into your mm -hmm. own mm -hmm. misery. Yeah. Do you have more work to do to help people uh – know themselves and work on themselves, or when someone's lonely is your job primarily to help them connect in better ways to others? The piece of loneliness that enters into therapy work is that it's a puzzle piece. It is not the entire continuum. It's rare that people come to therapy and say, I'm lonely. Mm -hmm. uh, people who would identify themselves as being lonely, you know, they're self-help groups, there are other activities. And I tell people regularly is find something that you like to do and find groups of people mm -hmm. who like to do that as well. I had a client years ago who was just really quite isolated and was very introverted but was a film buff. And so we found a film society that he went, that he was able to sit in the presence of other people who liked the same type of noir films that he enjoyed, and over the course of time, he began to warm to the group and mm -hmm. to begin to depend on the group and to begin to make some connections. And so uh, that is a piece of the therapy work, but I don't, I, it's rare that I would see someone who would come to therapy and say, I'm lonely, help me out. Are, are the introverts more likely to suffer from loneliness? There's a mixed bag on that. You know, introverts generally under stress go into their own resources. Extroverts mm. under stress are likely to look to the world for resources. Mm -hmm. And so you would think that that would be true. But with this whole notion of loneliness, it's where you don't know how to take care of yourself very effectively. And so what you have been doing simply doesn't work, and you find that you are less and less of your best self. But you're again saying it starts with lack of connection, and you kind of get in a downward spiral. It does indeed start from a lack of connection, and you get in a downward spiral, because as you identified when we first started this conversation, we all have these brief and occasional lonely moods. Mm -hmm. It's over time, and if there are adverse events, if Murphy's Law really does take hold, then over the course of time, if we don't find that we bounce, then we're going to be prone to isolate ourselves, and the isolation then leads to all of this insidious, oh. shadowy, dark, gloppy ugliness okay. that just is. Uh -huh. Well, let, let's the say uh, your boyfriend broke up with you. One person bounces back, one person doesn't. Why mm -hmm. don't they? That person. There is some interesting. Interesting work on romantic relationships, and we make the assumptions that uh, – and it's accurate – that in a romantic relationship that we're better. And what we – what's been said is very true is that there is a fair amount of strong emotional support in coupling, mm -hmm. uh, and that as people are indeed coupled – and where they have more intimate and emotional ties, they are going to feel stronger. Following the breakup, it depends on how the individual begins to attribute meaning to the relationship and the loss of the relationship. What makes this particularly interesting with younger people is that uh, there is common sense lore 
that if you can support a person, we'll find you somebody else to date, we'll get you through, through this, that friends and loved ones will mm-hmm. help you with all of this, that does not help. It doesn't? That, it does not help for an uncoupled individual. Uh, you mean if someone fact, just got broken up with and they yeah. have a lot of friends, that's not better than if you have no friends? If their friends say, oh, come out with us, then the individual who has just broken up is saying, well, I feel like a third wheel here. Mm-hmm. I don't want to come do this. This doesn't feel right. What they need to do is to spend some time in solitude. To begin to reattribute meaning to the loss, you can't just forget it. Mm-hmm. If you just try and forget about it or work your way away from it, then you're going to be prone to repeat the same problems that were. Well, let me throw out an alternative hypothesis to you. Okay. Um, looking at a man and a woman, mm-hmm. the man, the the girl dumps the guy. Four out of five men don't have any friends except their partner, real right. friends. So they got nobody. Right. The woman, if the man breaks up with the woman, she's got three or four good girlfriends she can really mm-hmm. connect with. Mm-hmm. Why wouldn't the man be lonelier? He probably will be. There are all sorts of gender variations in terms of socialization. Uh, women tend to have more intimate and emotional ties than men do. Yeah. Most of us men would rather not disclose how we feel. We mm-hmm. are just socialized towards that. Most men would rather stand out in the middle of rush hour traffic <laughs> and drop their pants than right. to say how, how they, they feel. feel. That being said, that type of exposure becomes a therapy issue where you teach the disclosure of feelings is not does not place you at risk. But you're quite right, is that women who do have friends are going to be able to have those confidants. It's just that it's not going to fully and completely address mm-hmm. the issue of the loneliness. Well, so they're a little better off because they, they can have solitude, but when they need it, they can have confidence, too, to get through this. That's exactly right. And that's, again, that's a socialization issue. You know, I like to think that we're moving away from that and becoming more egalitarian in the Mm -hmm. way that we are able to express our feelings Mm -hmm. uh, between genders. But the truth be known about it, we're Mm -hmm. still a couple of generations away with men and women being able to have better intimate language with same-sex relationships. You bet. And that raises the question, aren't men lonelier creatures than women? Don't know about that. I couldn't answer that. Anecdotally, it's not unusual that I will find that men will respond to their loneliness in a more macho and a stoic type of way mm-hmm. and seem to have a longer tolerance for this sense of isolation. Wow. But I, that, again, is just more of my own observation from my own practice, and so I have to be cautious about how I would say Well, that. if you start... By defining loneliness as a lack of meaningful social connections, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if you would, but if you do, wouldn't yeah, so men that's suffer exactly more? exactly how I would define it, yeah. Good. Okay. So wouldn't men suffer much more? Wouldn't it they would have... make sense to me that if men do not have those types of meaningful social connections, that they are willing to acknowledge. Mm-hmm. There, uh, there's a piece of it that has to do with the acknowledgement, with the talking, with the demonstration, with the behavioral aspect of being related. And so I think that there is a piece of this, because we can all go out, and I have heard clients say, I have said myself, you know, I can be in a crowd and feel lonely. Sure. And so it's a task to begin to do those activities that are demonstrably connecting. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that varies from person to person, but it has to be intentional, it has to be mindful, and it has to be conscious, or else we're going to do more of the same. And I'm hearing that's connecting to people or connecting to yourself or connected to interests. You get A, B, C, and D (laughs) is all of the above. And so the answer is you get connected to people, you get connected to the things that 
turn you on, warm you up, satisfy, mm-hmm. soothe, and then you find your passion, whatever your interest is mm-hmm. at the time. Finding those three, being able to fi- feel yourself be turned on, have an interest that that is directed to, and then be able to do that with others serving as witness in a group like my friend who got in the film society, mm-hmm. that's the antidote. So getting turned on to interests and passions and keeping busy, being helpful. But what about people who have poor social skills, who don't know how to show an interest in others, they're, or that's they're shy? A, that's a therapy task. Therapy, uh, psychotherapy can teach more prosocial skills. Oh. And so it is clearly an orientation towards the learning of therapy skills. Um, and so even individuals who are shy or folks who have lost their capacity, then that's the therapist's job to help to teach and facilitate the demonstration of specific behaviors that give the individual the tools they need to get reconnected. Yeah, it's, it's a certainly a passion of mine, and I know them in the interviewer, but... On this same website is a podcast I did on how to do that. Uh huh. My uh-huh. bias, if I may share it, is that sure. um, the biggest shortcoming is people don't know how to listen and show an interest in others. We are in a society these days that is much more narcissistic and much more egocentric, mm-hmm. and we are losing our capacity to be related in social ways. If I might go off on a tangent, I'm really thinking that a lot of that is related to the new social technology and social media. Why? Uh, I am not a fan of Facebook. Um, It limits face-to-face interaction, while Facebook certainly may have some value to others. I'm just not real sure that Facebook provides people instrumental aid. Social workers know. I'm a psychologist by Mm -hmm. training. Social workers know about instrumental aid. If you need somebody to take you to the doctor, who's going to do that? Mm -hmm. If you need somebody to uh, go grocery shopping for you, who's going to do that? And I don't know that you get as much of that Mm -hmm. with Facebook as we all need And so with this social technology, we develop this whole hyper-reality that seems more like a simulation of life than it does seem like what is real. Okay. Well, a lot of people use the Internet to find their match. Do you think if you're in a good, intimate relationship, you have the antidote for loneliness? Ask that again. Is a good relationship, intimate relationship, the uh, guaranteed anecdote for loneliness? A good romantic relationship is one of the primary antidotes to loneliness, yes. The type of loneliness and isolation that Jonathan Martin and I Mm -hmm. have described. Okay. Is it an antidote to the transient loneliness that we all experience or the transitional loneliness that's related to some type of specific change that we will all experience? No. Those are conditions of typical, normal, daily living. Like like uh, moving the, or what kind of well, thing? Well, m- moving, divorce. Oh, yeah. I'm uh, saying if you've got an intimate but, relationship, you know, that type it's of working. significant loss, we're going to have that. And when mm-hmm. we are in a new circumstance, yeah. then it yeah. is natural to feel sure. the type of loneliness and the type of disenfranchisement. But if you are in an intimate relationship, and intimate relationships can go over the Internet. I don't mean to suggest that that doesn't happen. Um, then that's going to be the antidote, yes. It's when you begin to uh, believe your own press and to create a persona. Uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, right. all of these things, they have their great value. But in terms of helping an individual to find some sense of authenticity, I think that that's pretty doubtful. Well, we'll end with that opinion that thought. 
It's very timely. <laughs> it is an opinion because there's not good research on it yet. Great. And, Jack, thank you so much for your uh, time with us, and uh, I hope you'll listen to the next edition of Insights. Mm-hmm.